I'm Paul Zigo, this is Cinema for Cynics, and Chauncey will back me up on this one. As cynical as I can be about films, I'm also very easily suckered into a good one. Every once in a while I'll see a film that I absolutely love, but I just know I don't ever want to face again. I don't typically find myself shying away from gore. It's more frank examinations of human emotional suffering that haunt me. We all have issues, and I love a film that challenges me to face mine, but some films cut a little close to the bone. Here, in no particular order, are five great movies that I will never watch again. Magnolia, 1999. Paul Thomas Anderson is one of my favorite directors working today, and he's high on my list of favorite directors of all time. He really excels at placing the most intimate of character examinations against the most beautiful sweeping backdrops. He's a master of capturing the feel of an era and then using it as a lens to examine these flawed characters under its harsh magnification. I love watching and re-watching his films, all except one. 1999's Magnolia ripped my guts out the first and only time I saw it. It's this multi-character film, and it follows a group of very different people uh, in the LA area for a day as their lives intersect to varying degrees. While it's certainly not the only focus, the movie examines very closely the relationship between parent and child, particularly the regret that comes at the end of a life. Though their problems differ, all of the characters in Magnolia are looking for forgiveness of one kind or another. When the credits rolled, I had this eerie feeling that it was me that was just examined. My own issues, most glaringly my estrangement from my own father, felt irritated and raw by the time the credits rolled. For hours after seeing the film, I was compelled to think about my own life, my failings as a son, my father's failings, and the meaninglessness of it all at the end. Uh, of all the traits examined in Magnolia, it was stubbornness that slapped me across the face the hardest. How unwilling am I to swallow my pride and take a step towards what's right? How much will that obstinance cost me as I get older? Magnolia forced me, almost as if by gunpoint, to face those things in myself and to see those things reflected in my father. It was beautiful and brilliant, and I never ever want to do it again. But let's get down to brass tacks. Let's get right down to it, boys. Let's get right down to it. Men are shit. What? Men are shit. Well, isn't that what they say? Happiness, 1998. Who doesn't love a movie that attempts to humanize someone who we'd normally look at as a villain? It's easy to disregard the human experiences of those we consider deviant or even criminal, even easier when sex is involved. We, at least here in America, seem to shy away from sex in a way that seems at odds with itself. We seem fascinated by the insinuation of sex, or sex as a broader concept, but deeply uncomfortable with detailed examinations of personal sexuality. Our kinks are taboo here, and writer-director Todd Salons is intent on rubbing our faces and other people's private sexuality and happiness. Hello? I know who you are, and you are nothing. You think you are fucking something, but you are fucking nothing. You are empty, you are a zero, you are a black hole, and I'm gonna fuck you so bad you're gonna be coming out of your ears. Another movie which follows a group of seemingly unconnected people as their lives intertwine, happiness invites you to take a hard look at the sexual desires of its characters. From the nascent sexuality of this 11-year-old boy who's obsessed with, for lack of a better term, blowing his first load, to a look at the very secret life of his pedophile father as he grooms and ultimately rapes one of his son's friends. There's a man who struggles with sexual desires that he just doesn't have the social skills to properly fulfill, and a teacher who crosses the line with a student. Even if you set aside the most shocking subject matter, uh, this movie's central pedophile arc, it feels uncomfortable throughout. It's not just the shocking depths that people will sink to in pursuit of fantasy fulfillment. It's also the feeling that you're kind of peeking in on people during their most private of times. As fascinating as I find sexuality and as much as I like discussing it, it's very difficult for me to sit through happiness. I left the movie bewildered by its honesty and feeling slightly ashamed that I had witnessed so many of the characters' deepest private desires fulfilled in excruciating detail. It was totally fascinating to get a glimpse of something so personal, but far too uncomfortable to ever want to experience again. No, I, I, 
I'm not normal. Requiem for a Dream, 2000. The destructive impact of drugs is the central focus of Darren Aronofsky's Requiem. I have to admit, I've seen this one a few times. The central performances delivered in the film are a total joy to watch, even if the subject matter isn't. Requiem is a blunt examination of the power of drugs to rip apart someone's entire social circle and family. We follow Jared Leto in a rarely great performance as Harry, a 20-something with a uh, heroin problem, as he goes about his life, which is completely structured around getting and using heroin. Harry and his friends have this plan that includes getting enough heroin so that they can sell it themselves to finance their habits in perpetuity. Things fall apart when the supply can't meet the demand and the entire group spins out of control in their pursuit of a fix. As hard as the scenes of the group's drug-fueled desperation are to watch, it's Harry's mother, played by Ellen Burstyn, that leaves the biggest mark. As she watches her son descend into his addiction, she's eaten alive by loneliness and isolation. She ends up spun out on a different kind of drug, in this case amphetamine-based diet pills. While Harry and his friends at least have each other to take comfort in, his mother is forced to face her demons totally alone. As beautiful as the performances are, particularly Burstyn's, the movie leaves me completely drained. There are no happy endings in Requiem, no real redemption, just the ugliness and desperation of substance abuse. The only progress that its characters make is downward, each sinking further and further into their own private hell. As much as I enjoyed the performances, I think I'm done with this one for good. I'll leave it to other people to experience it. I've seen enough. Why should I even make the bed or wash the dishes? I do them. But why should I? I'm alone. Kids, 1995. I saw this one when I was about the same age as the principal characters, around 15 years old. Kids follows this group of teenage friends as they live these unsupervised lives in New York City. As you can imagine, sex and drugs are the dual drum beats that kind of drive the plot. Kids is a day in the life film and it follows its characters over the course of 24 hours. Telly is a teenager who loves deflowering virgins. He not only enjoys the act of taking a girl's virginity, but the protection he believes it affords him against STDs. One of his formerly virgin girls finds out that she's been given AIDS by Telly and tries desperately to find him as he runs around the town with his friend Casper. Parents are almost totally absent in the film. Even though I have no children of my own and certainly didn't at 15 when I saw this film, I felt almost guilty as I watched these juveniles blithely ruin their lives with not a single adult who cares enough to intercede. Even the adults at the clinic where Telly's girl is AIDS tested seem incapable or unwilling to genuinely care. AIDS isn't the killer it once was, at least not here in the first world, but the message of kids remains potent. The movie culminates in a party and ultimately the rape of the girl who Telly infected with AIDS by his friend Casper. So. The cycle of destruction continues. Kids doesn't take you all the way to the end, but rather gives you a 24-hour glimpse into all these young lives and invites you to speculate on how things turn out. I don't mean to make up your mind for you, but my guess is not well. Kids also invite you to marvel at how much difference a seemingly normal day can make, which may be its scariest proposition. I've seen it once, I've never forgotten it, and I'll be honest, I've seen it enough. Jesus Christ, what happened? Elephant, 2003. I was just barely out of high school when the Columbine massacre happened in 1999. I can still remember the fear and hysteria that it caused. I had sisters that were in public school at the time, and even in our small town, the campuses were just like swarming with cops for days after the shooting. Gus Van Zant's Elephant is based loosely on those shootings. Now, Rather than attempting to explain away the massacre, Elephant seeks to instill its viewers with the feeling of bewilderment and confusion that we all felt when we learned of Columbine. There, there's no answers in Elephant, only questions. The two killers seem to be pretty average kids, both with hobbies and aptitudes. As we see them planning the massacre, we naturally wonder why, but we're never given that answer. 
The movie places you in the school with the shooters and the victims and constantly rewinds itself to show the massacre as it unfolds from different perspectives. Elephant is one of the ultimate show-don't-tell movies, almost to the point of being frustrating. Scenes of teachers and students going about their days, unaware of what's coming, leave you drained. You, you the viewer, you, you know what's coming, but you're just as powerless as the film's characters to stop it. You're along for the ride in Elephant. You're strapped in, helpless and confused, with your mind desperately asking why over and over as the violence unfolds again and again. The gore and the violence don't have a movie feel either. It's just senseless, swift, brutal, and most disturbingly random. You get the feeling at times that you're watching real footage of a school shooting, and the calm demeanor of the shooters throughout really echoes some of that eerie security cam footage released of Columbine. Even in the end, Elephant offers you no answers. There's no this-could-have-been-avoided silver lining, no explanation, just an invitation to sit and watch the horror unfold, and then later to take it home with you as your pattern-seeking brain looks for the answers. Once again, there are no answers in Elephant. I think above all else, that, that's what makes it disturbing. It's a question that we're still invited to ask in the present day when the number of mass shootings many at schools continues to mount. It's one of the most thought-provoking movies I've ever seen, and one that I don't ever plan on seeing again. Hey, you guys. And that is it. Anybody with me? Let me know in the comments and do me a favor. If there are any movies I didn't mention that you think would make this list, tell me about them. I'm always looking to be disturbed. If you had a good time with this video, like it, subscribe for more, follow us on social media. Also, hit that alert bell so you know when the new shit hits. Thanks. That was a great video, but I'll never watch it again. <laughs>